Hi friends, this is John, and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where we talk about the agronomic science and the cultural management practices that regenerate plant health, soil health, and ultimately public health. This podcast has a lot of listeners from the land down under, but we haven't yet had a guest appear on the show from Australia. And today, I am very pleased and honored to have Terry McCosker here. Uh, Terry has a very intriguing story. He is one of these wise elders of regenerative agriculture in the Australian landscape, has had a tremendous influence and tremendous impact on the adoption of regenerative agriculture across Australia. So, Terry, I'm very excited to have you here and to get you to share some of your wisdom with those of us here in the States. I think there are many people in the regenerative agriculture space here in North America who haven't heard your name, who are not familiar with your work. And so I'd love to begin this conversation by hearing more about your story. Tell us about your pathway and what brought you here. You've been in agriculture for a number of decades and have a lot of wisdom to share. So what's the story that brought you here? Thank you, John, and thank you for for having me on your podcast. Uh, I'm I'm a great fan, and there are many, many Australians now that are listening to your podcast. Myself and my children and many of our staff now are, are really great fans of yours, so it's an honour to, uh, to be on your podcast. I think I arrived at regenerative agriculture partly by accident, but partly by design. And I have been in the game now for five decades, but not necessarily. I, I think I spent my first two decades in conventional agriculture. When I was a a young person, I had an unbelievable opportunity to work for an American company on an Australian cattle station. And there was enormous problems and they were losing a lot of money. And my job description was they wanted somebody who knew something about growing grass. And I thought I knew something about growing grass. Uh, So anyway, I got a, a job and I found that all the management practices and science that they'd been trying to implement on that particular property. And it was, uh, you know, 800,000 acres and we had 12,000 cows uh, and four or 5,000 horses and another four or 5,000 buffalo. And that scale was was new to me. But when I went for the interview, it was a three-day interview and they said, well, you've got the job. And I said, well, I don't want it. And uh, they said, well, <laughs> why not? And I said, well, I don't know anything. You know, I, I, I've never worked in this environment. I don't know these trees. I don't know these plants. I don't know these soils. I've never worked on anything of this scale. I don't think I can help you. And they said something to me then that uh, I have never forgotten. And they said, no, we want somebody who has no preconceived ideas. So on that basis, I took the job. And I spent time looking at what was going wrong in the business and particularly with the ecology. And there was a lot wrong. And at the end of six months, I said to them, look, just sell up and get out of here because what you're trying to do is not working. And they said, well, we're not used to walking away from a problem. Uh, Tell us what we need to do. And I was 28 at the time. And I said to them, well, give me... uh, you know, a, a million bucks in three years and I'll sort it out for you. So they said, well, you better do it. Well, I sat back on my heels and I thought, whoa, what what hole have I just dug myself into here? So I, I put together a research project to solve the problems that I'd seen when I was driving around. And a funny thing happened. Um, I put this project together And then my intuition started playing up and my intuition kept saying to me, there's something wrong with this. And so I said to one of the guys I was working for, I said, look, there's something wrong with what I've just put together to research. And he said, what is it? And I said, I don't know. But I said, I I need to go and talk to more people. So what I did was I went back to my roots in, and I used to work for the Queensland Department of Primary Industries and and had good connections with with a lot of scientists in CSIRO. So I went back and met with a lot of those people and spent three to four weeks. And what happened was every time I explained my situation, I actually learnt more about what it was. And it wasn't 
necessarily what people said to me, but it was me having to repeat my story. And every time I repeated it over about three to four weeks, it got clearer. So I flew back to the station after that and I, I said to Cliff, well, Cliff, we've got to go 180 degrees away from what we've just decided on. And uh, we sat down on our front lawn for two days and argued. And at the end of two days, I had him convinced that we needed to change 180 degrees. And the guys, this few executives were coming out from New York a week later to approve the first R&D project I'd put together. So I sent them off a telex. So this is back in the 80s and said, you know, I've changed my mind. We need to do something completely different. So they they came out and I gave them about a six-page report on why we needed to do something different. They came to the station, grabbed that report, went straight back to to town and and stayed there for about three to four days. And we found out later they were trying to sack get rid of Cliff and myself because we'd we'd lost it. And anyway, they, they couldn't replace us in three to four days. So they came down to have it out. And we spent another three days with a big whiteboard sitting in a shed arguing. And at the end of three days, I had them convinced that where I'd got to was right. That's an unbelievable thing to get these very senior executives with a lot of wisdom and age behind them and a 28-year-old kid basically saying that everything you've been doing for the last 12 or 13 years is wrong and so is all the science and let's start again. And I guess that was one of my real epiphanies and I I knew then that I didn't know anything and so I had to work out everything from first principles. What was the conclusion that you came to? What was the pitch that you were presenting to them that was so different from the mainstream? Well, in the, the Northern Territory, it was in those days, the common form of production, it was it's very extensive and it was basically cattle hunting. So there was no fences and no infrastructure and you would go out with a team of people and, and helicopters were just starting to come in in those days and you would go and find cattle and bring them in and anything that was big enough to sell, you would just put it on a truck and if the price was okay, you'd send it off to the abattoir. And then you just let everything else go. And if the price was right next year, you come back and do the same again. So there was absolutely no control. There was no animal production. And the production in that system was very, very low, but so were the overheads. And what they had done was moved into what I would call middle ground. So the option was they're running, we're running basically a beast to 100 acres, and we were getting 44% calving, uh, 15% mortality in cows. But in under that old system, that was okay. You didn't measure any of those things and it was cheap to do. The alternative to that was go to a complete high input system where we develop pastures where we could run, you know, a beast to two acres and get improved animal performance and total control over the system. But where they were was in no man's land. They were sowing legumes into native pasture and putting superphosphate on. I remember the first year I was there, they'd ordered a 1,000 tonnes of superphosphate and one of my first jobs was to go out with aircraft and spread that superphosphate over thousands and thousands of acres. And it was really a waste of time. So the basic that I got back to was said, well, we're throwing phosphorus on the ground to try and get it to an animal we're planting legumes to try and get protein to an animal. Why don't we just feed protein and phosphorus directly to the animals and then go and develop replacement pastures for at the high input end? And where that ended up was still had low animal performance but had built high overheads into the business, so they are actually in no man's land. And so what I said was, we've got to go back to the two edges, get out of where you've been, and we have to develop the technology to feed animals and manage them extensively and increase the reproduction rates and decrease the mortalities. And then we have to develop pasture systems that are more intensive from scratch. And that's what we did. So how did you approach regenerating? I I suppose regeneration is not quite what you're describing yet, but uh, how did you approach implementing these changes on that type of scale? And then what happened a few years after? 
we did very extensive research and my breeder trial, my cow trial, for example, I had uh, 1,300 cows on twenty on 30,000 acres with a number of treatments, looking at reproduction, looking at nutrition, a whole range of things. And that was, uh, and, and I took the, the, carry, the stocking rate rather down to a beast to 35 acres. And then at the other end, we um, screened a whole lot of plants that I got from the scientists and that, were, that had been brought in from all over the world. And so we found plants that were going to grow in that environment as a result of that. Where we got to was we actually solved every problem we set out to solve. We also found a lot of problems we didn't know were there on the way through. And with the the cow herd, for example, we took the mortality from 14% down to 2%. And we took the reproduction rate from 44% up to 72% and increase the weight of calves taken off, et cetera. So we'd significantly increase productivity. But one of the things I noticed was that even when we shifted from a beast to 100 acres to a beast to 35 acres, our desirable perennial grasses were in decline. And within a four-year period, I was measuring a decline in those good quality grasses. And so... I went looking for solutions to that and I brought a number of scientists in and I drive them around and say, look, this is what's happening. You can see these plants. You can see things going out here. What's happening? And the response I got on every occasion was, oh, that's just normal. And I tucked that away and I didn't want to accept that that was normal. And it wasn't until five years after that that I then met Dr. Stan Parsons, a Zimbabwean who actually had introduced cell grazing to the US with with Alan Savory. I met him and once I started to understand what he was saying, then I had a solution to what I had seen in the territory. Uh, By that stage, they'd sold the property and moved on. But for me, one of my big learnings was I learned not to be a reductionist, but that we were working with systems and I had access to people in all sorts of disciplines, experts from all over the world in any field that I needed it. And so I had consultants and experts visited me on a regular basis and also did an enormous amount of reading. But what I found was that a lot of, you know, you would get an expert would come along and with their blinkers on, each expert could solve 80% of your problems. And, you know, mathematically, you get 10 experts together and they're each solving 80% of your problems that, you know, straight away that doesn't work. So what I developed the skill to do was to pull out what would work and how that would fit into an overall system that had a design and outcomes uh, around it. And I guess that was my first stage towards moving towards being uh, holistic and was really developing that systems thinking and challenging everything that was going on around me. I didn't accept after that conventional science and, and stuff that was published. If it didn't fit and it didn't look like it was right, then it wasn't right. I didn't accept it. You were then very influential in bringing cell grazing and Stan Parsons' work into Australia on a really significant scale following this. Is that right? That's correct. So yeah, in 89, uh, I first met Stan and and immediately we decided to work together and bring stuff to Australia. I was still quite sceptical about the cell grazing stuff, but everything else he was saying made a lot of sense because it was it was holistic. He was dealing with the people issues, the financial issues, the production issues, the ecological issues, the grazing issues. All of those things were fitting together into a neat a neat package and for a while I was actually quite skeptical thinking well nothing's that neat you know it can't be that neat because I was coming from reductionist training and and actually reductionist experience it took me a little while to accept holism but not not just holism but accept that when you work with mother nature she actually works with you and it does work it does fit together provided you get out of the way and let nature do what she wants to do things are actually simpler and do fit very nicely so that's uh, that's where we we started 
I'm curious what this process looked like for you. You were approaching this from a, the perspective of a skeptic. So how did you validate to yourself, or how did you become comfortable with the idea that uh, cell grazing and this holistic approach were the right approach? So firstly, I was threatened by a very senior officer in the Department of Primary Industries that said, look, I hear you're bringing Parsons to Australia. And I said, yep. He said, well, we've got a pile of literature three inches deep showing how Parsons and Savory have destroyed land all over the world, wherever they've been, and we're going to run him out of the country. And if you get mixed up with him, you're going to go down with him. And they tried very hard to put us out of business and very, very nearly succeeded. And so I had to decide who was right. Was was all this literature right or was Stan and Alan Savory right? And I was very fortunate to get a Churchill Fellowship. And that Churchill Fellowship enables me to travel through the United States and through Africa, through Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa. And I went everywhere where Parsons and Savory had been. And I went right back to their roots. And I visited places, people they'd trained, I visited people they'd worked with. And very, very quickly, it became very evident that the holistic approach and certainly the cell grazing approach to grazing was the answer to a lot of issues that uh, we were seeing in our ecosystems. And so that trip very quickly confirmed to me that I was right, that they were right rather. And then I had to decide, well, how am I going to handle the opposition? Because every scientist, grassland and rangeland scientist in Australia was dead against what we were saying. And the opposition was, it was phenomenal. And we tried to talk to them and tried to reason and ask them to come and see what we were talking about and what we were doing. And and that didn't work. And I remember sitting in Harare in Zimbabwe for a few days waiting for an aircraft to fly home, writing up my report. And I had to decide how was I going to handle this opposition when I got home. And I decided there and then that I would never again try and convince people that did not want to listen. And I would only work with people who were ready to listen. And that's what I did. And away we went. And it's grown enormously from there. And that strategy has worked really, really well. When you say it has grown enormously from there, I think that's a statement that needs some clarification for our audience. It's my understanding that you have worked with uh, close to 10,000 farmers, approaching 10% of Australia's farmland that has been uh, under your coaching over the last three decades. Yes, it is. It, It does cover a little bit of landscape. Not all of that by the way, it's been successful. You know, people uh, make mistakes, don't actually get the principles or don't get the holistic approach because we've all been raised in this reductionist approach to everything and getting that head shift is quite significant. Charles Massey, who uh, who wrote the book uh, Call of the Reed Warbler, uh, his claim, and he, he did his PhD on looking at uh, regenerative agriculture and most of them, a, very, a big majority of the people that he interviewed were actually were our clients. And he came to the conclusion that I'd influenced more landscape positively in Australia than any other person. Um, so that was, that was Charles's um, take on it. It's not something that we claim, but it, but I'll take it. Um. <laughs> yeah. It's a significant compliment. What was that pathway like from those early days of learning about holistic management and Stan Parsons and Alan Savory's work, bringing that back to Australia. What was the pathway from there to your organization of RCS as it exists today? So RCS had actually existed for five years before we went down this track. So we were a conventional sort of uh, consulting firm, not making much money, not making any headway. And uh, then I met Stan and I realized then that what I had to do basically with the rest of my life. And so we, I committed, Pam and I, my wife and I committed to going down this holistic track and introducing this stuff to agriculture in Australia. And so initially it was Pam and I and Stan would come out two to three times a year and, and initially he would do the teaching and it took me about three years before uh, he would allow me to do any teaching. 
and I was doing consulting and follow up in the background. And we realized very early on that the numbers were building quite quickly and therefore the ability for me to consult and follow up with all those people was very limited. So we started developing group work and one of the concepts and products we developed was a process called Executive Link which is a peer-to-peer learning and support process. And it's probably one of the most powerful things uh, that we've done. And Executive Link, where we put businesses together in boards of six businesses, and each business then helps the other business. And so you end up with two very powerful things. You end up with peer support for tough decisions, and you end up with peer pressure when actions are not happening and the combination of those two things creates massive change and gives people the confidence for the sort of changes that need to be made and so in the first three years of executive link it was not very successful we had uh, about a 50 percent attrition rate Uh, in other words 50 percent of people were leaving within three years and so at the end of that first three year period i sat down with uh one of the great guys that was working with me at the time, uh, Stuart MacArthur, and we said, righto, what's what's wrong with this and how do we fix it? And we interviewed a lot of the people that left and we also worked out ourselves what was wrong. And one of the things that was wrong was there was no accountability in terms of economics. So I then built, uh, worked with a local university to build our own benchmarking and business analysis software and once we got that software into it and then everybody was benchmarking and analyzing their their numbers in a very consistent way and those numbers were on the table the honesty levels changed and we had some real stuff to work with Uh, and that was one of the catalytic things that that changed the uh, the way it operated and we changed some of the just sort of processes and and the way we were doing it. And so that was about uh, 94, 95. We got that really starting to crank. And in the last 25 years, it really hasn't changed much uh, in format. And it's still as powerful as it ever was. And what happens in that process is that it takes a little time to build trust. But as that trust builds, more and more stuff comes out. And my experience indicates that the biggest holdup in every business is not economic and it's not ecological, it's it's people. And it's people issues, it's communication, it's intergenerational communication and issues, it's gender communication and issues. And once people are in a in a very, very safe environment, and they can start to bring up those very, very personal issues, it's then possible to shift some of those people issues. And at the moment those things are out of the way, everything else then flourishes. Getting a very clear vision and way forward that's agreed is a real key to going from there. I've always been intrigued by the process of or trying to understand what is the process that we use to make decisions, that we as humans use to make decisions. And it's it's interesting, actually, when you dig into the science a little bit, to discover that fundamentally not a single decision is ever a logical decision, but they're all emotional. And uh, that's, there's some really interesting science behind all of that. I was intrigued... A moment ago, you mentioned Charles Massey's book, The Call of the Reed Warbler, in which he described that of the people that he interviewed, 60% of the farmers began adopting a regenerative agriculture practices as a result of some personal crisis. And whether that was a health crisis in the family or an economic crisis on the farm, But then it wasn't clear to me, or perhaps I missed it, it wasn't clear to me, what about the remaining 40%? And has that 60%, 40% shift been true historically? Is it beginning to shift now? So I'd I'd love to hear your perspective. Um, Are more farmers, now that you have, if you have impacted personally and through your organization, if you have impacted 10% of the agricultural landscape, 
Is it approaching the threshold where it is becoming normal and people adopt a different management practice without the personal crisis? What does the future... So there's kind of two questions here. One is, what's the process that farmers go through to arrive at this decision? And uh, how do you see that changing and shifting in the future at all? I believe it has shifted. Our biggest selling point is word of mouth. And uh, so our clients tend to come from recommendations uh, and that usually there's family and then there's friends and then there's local you know, people in the local district. And so little groups and hubs start to develop. What I find now is the thing that probably drives the change and drives people into the education more than the crisis is funding. And when there's funding available for education, people will come and do it. And it's a strange thing. But it's, it means that people are not valuing knowledge as much as they should. They don't value it as something that they should invest in. But if the government comes along and is prepared to invest in their education, and that education is the right education, and it then turns them on to learning, then they're on a life, lifelong learning journey from then on. It's interesting that I think the schooling experience, has, I believe, has actually turned off a lot of people to be learners. And once they have a really good experience with learning again, then they become much more interested in continuing to learn. So I'm finding at the moment that probably 20% now of the people coming through our programs are now second generation. In other words, I have we've, I've taught their parents and these are now people in their late teens uh, to through to mid-20s or so that are now coming through. And I've been around long enough now to have uh, I'm up to number nine of the of grandchildren. So in other words, I taught the grandparents, the parents are now the grandchildren. That's very rewarding to see the next generation that's grown up with some of these principles coming through just as part of their education as a standard part of what they need to do. We're also finding that the cohort that we're getting has changed age. When we first started, and I would say for probably the first 15 years, as, as a rough rule of thumb, the majority of people that were coming to our programs were from 45 up. Now, the vast majority are from 45 down. And one of the, for the first 15 or 20 years, one of the biggest obstacles we had to deal with continuously was succession. And I found that the generation that's in the late 70s and into their 80s and 90s now did not do succession well. They held things to themselves. They were poor communicators and they they made it very, very hard for the next generation. Right now, we're finding that the baby boomers are starting to do succession. And as a general rule, I find that they're doing it earlier and they're doing it better. And so I think that's a reason why we're getting a lot of younger people coming through. So now, whereas 15 years ago, we would have had uh, an executive link, for example, we would have had 70 to 80% of the people would have been dealing with a, a succession trauma. Now it would be 20% or less and 80% have completed it and now have debt, have control and are coming to learn and change so that they can make a difference and uh, have a really good business and a really good life moving forward. I think this is a really important issue because we are here in North America, or in the States at least, we're at a moment in time right now where 50% of the farmland in the country is uh, needs to go through succession in the next 10 to 15 years. And... Uh, that's that's more farmland changing hands than has ever changed hands in such a condensed period ever before in history here in the country. What advice do you have for uh, people on both ends of that succession process? How what have you observed that has made that what 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 has brought about to this shift from the prior generation to the current generation, facilitating succession much more smoothly? Firstly, it's being talked about a lot more. There's 
you know, there's field days and there's uh, workshops and all sorts of things now where succession is being encouraged and talked about. I think that's the first thing. In terms of supporting succession, in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that the thing that makes it either smooth or bad is communication. Part of that communication is respect. So the and it's respect in both directions. Younger generation must respect the ownership of the older direct uh, and the knowledge of an older generation, and the older generation must respect the needs of a younger generation. The worst thing that I think families can do is go and talk to lawyers and accountants to have them do deal with succession. Immediately, that just starts the thing down a track of dealing with function dealing with structure rather than with communication so my belief is that they need to do some training themselves in communication and learn how to communicate better understand different personality types all of that makes a big difference so communication firstly the second point then is that once you're able to communicate honesty and putting things on the table including goals and visions It's surprising how many times the older generation expects the younger generation wants to come home and take over the farm when the younger generation is only there or doing it because they feel obliged to do it and it's not actually their real dream. And I think one of the things that has to happen very early is everybody's goals, visions and dreams need to be on the table. And succession needs to be a process and a discussion that takes everybody towards their dreams and not just assume that that is a farm. And I find in the older generation, there's many, many women that, uh, particularly in in, uh, remote areas, that have spent, given up their life to be on the land and, and in remote areas and really want to spend the last 20 or so years of their life back in society and and doing other things. And so, again, there needs to be a little bit of uh, give and take even within generations as to where we go. But it's absolutely important that all of that's on the table and understood. So communication, goals, visions, respect, and then I think facilitation. I think it's important for families to have external facilitators to help bring together and use a process to facilitate succession. And those facilitators should not be the family accountant or the family lawyer. They should be people with skills in facilitation because you're going to be dealing with tears. You're going to be dealing with all sorts of emotions. And this is an emotional process on both sides. And we all need to understand that. And it's not easy for any side. So I think those are the sort of ways that we... uh, tend to try and help it. I find I'm intrigued by the direction this conversation has gone rather than having a conversation about agronomy and field management. As you mentioned early on, it is really about people. And so the the question that I have in in your, you, you obviously have had a tremendous influence and impact, which means that RCS as a consulting organization has been successful at guiding and supporting and helping people rather than just focusing on the agronomy or regenerative management or grazing or whatever the agronomic context might be. So my question for you is, how have you done that? What has, what's the process look like of really supporting people? Okay, there's two things that you're dealing with. One is wants and the other is needs. And the thing that most people will talk about is their wants. If you start asking questions, you'll get the wants. You won't necessarily get to the needs. And I think the key to our success is that we tend to market to wants and we start with wants. And wants are meeting people where they're at. But over time, you've got to meet needs. And needs are deeper. And to get to needs and feelings... You've got to have a level of trust, a level of understanding, and we find that having common language. So we use a process where we have a a school up front, which is seven days of very, very intensive 
education. And we don't expect people to remember more than, you know, 20% of it. But it's a process that's designed to open people's minds and break down paradigms and create common language. And when you've done those three things, you've got an open mind, you can challenge paradigms, and you've got a common language and potentially a common bond, then it's easier and faster to get to those needs and feelings. But we will be dealing with the production and the business and so on on the way because the businesses have to be profitable and they have to be regenerating regenerating landscape and regenerating business. So for 20-odd, 25, 30 years, we've been talking about renewal, that there's four key things in that you've got to renew, and that's the, the people and our attitudes and so on. You've got to renew the business and our understanding of business. We have to renew the ecosystem and the productions uh, and the, the landscape, and we have to renew the production systems, whether that's in cropping or whether that's in grazing. So we work with those four key sort of foundational elements. And at the pace and in the direction that people need at the time. And once you've built the rapport and the trust, then you will start moving into the the people stuff. Um, But often you build the trust by getting it right uh, and giving the right sort of advice or very useful advice on the production issues and and business issues where people can save money or make money uh, fairly quickly. It changes from person to person, business to business, the order in which things happen because we sort of have a, a floating process, if you like, and all of our coaches uh, and advisors, uh, I think pretty well everyone that I employ today has been taught by me and they're all ex-clients. So they've come right through the process. Some of them are are still on the land and still uh, producing, but they want to give back. And some of them are now retired and full of wisdom and experience. And so they have the breadth of knowledge and experience to sit down at a kitchen table with either a 20-year-old or a 70-year-old couple, for example, and deal with whatever comes up. And I find that that is what's important. And it's that ability to deal holistically with with whatever the family is dealing with. So we, I class myself as a specialist generalist and I don't think there are very many specialist generalists. There's a lot of specialists, but generalists who specialise in being generalists, in other words, that can put the big picture together and understand all the bits, that's rarer than specialists. Uh, and I think our need is for more generalists who actually understand to a degree, the specialties as well. When you use the terminology of holistic thinking, and this has really come out in this, in our conversation so far already, how you integrate the people and the landscape and the ecology and and all of these different pieces, but how has your own thinking evolved over the decades that you have been in this process? How, How would you describe... Uh, your own holistic thinking today compared to your thinking five decades ago? At one level, it hasn't actually changed. I think the thing that was one of my biggest epiphanies was, and this was 30 odd years ago, is that agriculture can and should be based on ecosystem health and not be extractive in, you know, in a sense that we're degrading landscape. And that if we work with ecosystems and we understand how those ecosystems work uh, and work with them and with a a really simple set of principles, then life gets easier and a whole lot of things get easier. And I think that, and I think over in the 30 odd years that I've been teaching this stuff, the one bit that always grabs the attention, the excitement, and creates that first excitement and that first glimmer of change with farmers is understanding they're working on an ecosystem and understanding that there's a few tools that they're using and they're using them either to damage it or to improve it. 
and none of them want to damage it and, and a lot of times have not understood like the, you I guess one way to put it is a, a client of mine once said that he thought he was a a livestock producer and then he came to one of our programs and went away thinking that he was a grass producer and then over time as he's learnt more and more he now believes he's a soil manager and it's that change that if you understand then that if you're a soil or an ecosystem manager the production will actually and the economics will actually look after itself so that I don't think has changed. The thing that has changed for me is understanding more and more the energetics of what we're doing, the importance of intention in what we're doing and the incredible power in what we call subtle energy. So we've been introducing subtle energy to our clients now for probably nearly 25 years. We've been doing it more intensively for the last 10 years, running a course called Quantum Agriculture. And I've come to understand that the support that's available to us is only limited by our imagination. And I can give you many examples of that. So, and I guess the more I've learned and the deeper I've come to understand that, the more I've started to understand that to be truly regeneratively regenerative, a farmer needs to understand that they are a part of the ecosystem, not apart from it. And when you make that switch and then start working at an energetic level, the sky's the limit. I think it's amazing what you can do and what you can produce in landscapes. When, and, and in fact, talking to and working with landscape, working with soils, working with plants. You know, we had a, I'll give you an example of how landscape can react. We uh, was doing a carbon project with one of our clients a few years ago and we, we'd gone around with a, with a corer and drilled about 300 holes on his property. As we were finishing that, he had cattle in the yards and the cattle got very, you know, um, unrestful and jumped out of the yards and and sort of bolted and they've never done that before now fortunately he was switched on to what had actually happened and the landscape had reacted to the fact that we'd gone around and put these pit pricks in it and not explained to it what we were doing or why we were doing it we immediately explained to the landscape what we were doing and why we were doing it and the whole thing settled down the animals settled down and in some of this work we find for example that farms don't know what their purpose is you you might have something that's converted from a dairy farm and is now a vegetable farm but that landscape can still think it's a dairy farm and until it knows it's a vegetable farm it can't actually do the right thing with you until you can communicate and work with the nature spirits, for example, then they will help. And and my experience in talking with the nature spirits is that they get so excited when a human talks to them and asks for their help. They've been waiting for eons to be asked for their help. And so I think that's probably the level of understanding that's grown over the last 30 years around regeneration of landscapes and not just landscapes but human health as well i find it interesting that this energetic aspect of agriculture has my perception is that it has become very widely adopted in australia Uh, obviously that's my perception from a distance i don't know that to be true for certain but i know that um, here in the states there is the comments, the statements that you just raised, that you just spoke about, would raise a lot of eyebrows and a lot of question marks. Uh, there is still a strong desire for the kind of the scientific perspective. How how do you reconcile the this energetic component with a scientific perspective that you have come from historically? That's a great question, John. And wasn't until I read a book called The Field 
um, which explored consciousness that I started to realize that there was um, there was a lot of science behind this and that science is in quantum physics and I've tried to read a couple of quantum physics books and and the author of one of those said if you think you understand quantum physics you don't understand quantum physics you know I believe that the science for this is certainly in quantum physics and uh, and the understanding of it is is there and and has been explained if you can understand the language. So I tend to explain some of this in terms of, of quantum physics and and in waves and uh, in terms of energy. Uh, and don't get me wrong, there'll be a lot of people uh, in Australia that will think I'm a nutcase as well by telling you what I've just told you. But what I'm finding now is that if I had talked like that 20 years ago, and I don't think I would have been capable of talking like that 20 years ago because I wouldn't have had the experiences that I have now. But had I, I think 90% of the people I'd have spoken to would have thought that I've lost it. Now I think that's down to 20 to 30%. And I say that based on the fact that I now introduce these concepts right up front on the second day that I'm working with people. Not in a hard way, but in a sort of a light way. And I'm now finding that 70 to 80% of my audience is engaged and interested. And 20% remain very sceptical. In the thousands of people that I've taught individually, the last course that I taught just before COVID hit, I had one person walk out because of the language that I used. That's the only time I've ever had that reaction just recently. But I don't apologise for the language and the way that I talk now because I do believe that we have to be honest and we have to be upfront that there's more involved in this than than just plants and soils and bugs and so on. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, it's, it, it's interesting actually and I've spoken about this before here on this podcast and other places that when we are speaking about livestock production, it is almost expected that good livestock managers have a sense of connection to their livestock. They intuitively know when one of them is off or when one isn't feeling well, even when there is nothing physical that they can point to. It's just an intuitive sense that they know something is wrong. We think that that is normal or common or even to be expected of good livestock managers, but we don't often transfer that same perspective to working with the landscape, working with plants and soils and the landscape as a whole. When in reality, what we have observed is that generally the farm managers who produce the best results the most consistently are those farm managers who have developed that empathy with the landscape. Yeah, and I think probably the one of the ways in which I get people engaged is actually give practical examples because I don't think this is is so scientific that it's not practical. I'll give you a couple straight up. One is a, a, a guy who tested this with uh, sheep and he was sending truckloads of sheep into a, a large market. So there's 10,000 sheep for sale most weeks at the sale and he would send uh, truckloads in. He did this four times in a row over two months. And as those sheep were getting on the truck, he blessed them and intended for those sheep to top the sale in their class. And then you get the, the sale records a few days later and you pour through those. And four times out of four, his sheep topped the sale in their class. And I think that's probably beyond coincidence. We've seen and we work with water, for example, changing the quality of water in a well or a bore, changing the quality of water in a creek for livestock. You know, one example was a on a property that had a, a dams and uh, bore water and the sheep and cattle would not drink the bore water, but they always wanted to drink the dam water. And so one of our mentors in this instance, a fellow called Dr. Patrick McManaway, and Patrick was leading a course. So they went out to this bore and Patrick got a, a glass of water out for every person and just put that aside. And then 
they did a little ceremony with, you know, five minutes and basically blessed the water and asked it to do what they wanted it to do. And then he got another glass of water straight out of that well, uh, out of the pump immediately and got people to taste the water before and after. And the quality of that water completely changed in that instance. And what happened to the livestock behavior then was those livestock would then run to the troughs to get access to that water instead of using the dam water. And uh, that farmer then had to go and do some work on the dam water so that they would actually drink both after that. It's extremely practical. You, uh, we've had people deal with insect problems in crops, deal with predator problems. I have a, a snake problem. We have a lot of venomous snakes where we are and I've got grandchildren. And uh, so I've I communicate with the snakes and the venomous snakes. Uh, we did a, I, I did a negotiation with them as to where they could come and uh, where they couldn't and what the consequences were if they, if they broke those rules. And I was in my veggie patch one morning very early on and there was a, a black snake, a venomous snake, sitting six inches outside the boundary that I had set for it and just watched me for... Probably 10 minutes, I was just moving around. I'd go away and I'd come back and do some stuff in the garden. And then, and this black snake just sat there and watched. And the interesting thing is, I used to have a great fear of snakes. I was not fearful. I turned my back on it. I was not in the least bit worried about it. And it wasn't worried about me. And then after 10 minutes or so, it just turned and quietly went off in the opposite direction and stayed in its own territory. So that's what's called a psychic boundary. And We have people doing the same with uh, wild dogs and we have dingo problems in Australia where they they kill calves and lambs and things like that. And I did one in the States last year where I uh, communicated with four packs of wolves uh, to stop them from killing cattle and that was successful. So I think there's a lot of things that if we open up our mind and our imagination, there's a lot of practical stuff that we can actually do. And I think Farmers need to understand that this stuff is not woo-woo, it's not out there, it's actually there's some really good science behind it and it's very, very practical. These are all areas that uh, one of my mentors, Bruce Tainio, was um, very comfortable with and very good with and uh, I think it was a significant loss to agriculture here in North America when he passed away a number of years ago. I'd like to change the conversation into a completely different area, but something that I think is extremely important. You live on a continent that is very drought prone. And here in North America, we live on a continent that we are turning into a drought prone continent, even though we historically have one of the most agricultural richest landscapes on the planet. And uh, you wrote an article a couple of years ago on how droughts are man-made and that we are creating our own droughts. I think this is something that you have a particularly important perspective on that I really would want to hear your thoughts about. So how are we creating droughts? How have you created droughts in Australia? And uh, how is that information transferable to our ecosystem here in North America. There was an old comedy show in the uh, in the UK back in the 50s. One of the old farmers, who, he had a role as an old farmer and whenever he was asked anything, he would always say, well, I think the answer lies in the soil. And I think that that's exactly the situation here. The answer to our droughts lies in the soil and essentially the decarbonisation of our soils. And I'll give you an example. Last year, I was uh, teaching a course down in in New South Wales and over lunch, we had put it into inches. Uh, We had about half an inch of rain in in, um, half to three quarters of an hour and up to probably three quarters of an inch. Then we were going on a field trip and we drove out of the town and through the landscape. And that half inch of rain was pouring off the landscape. The water was gushing down the side of the road. And then when we drove back four hours later, on the flat landscape, the water was still sitting there four hours later with only half an inch of rain. And I thought to myself, how will this 
landscape ever overcome a drought if rain can't do it? You know, if we can't get moisture into the soil. It was a beautiful soil and beautiful uh, landscape and it's been completely denuded. And that's happened through overgrazing, overstocking, overplowing, um, you know, all the old things that we know about. We drove for an hour through that landscape before we got to one regenerative farmer. And on that property we got to, the water was still rushing off the hills on the neighbouring properties and coming onto their property. And within 100 to 150 metres, that water was just disappearing straight into the soil. It was a great demonstration to everybody there about the just the difference. And so, and the only difference was that the people we'd been to had managed their livestock, so they weren't overstocked. They had maintained ground cover. They were still in business when the people around them were were feeding stock. And then a, a, a woman wrote to me, and she'd been driving through a long drive, and she wrote and said, "Look, I've, I'm seeing a decline in in our landscape." compared to 10 years ago. That made me think about our social license to continue agriculture. And I think that if we don't start changing what's happening out there, we will lose that social license. And I I don't think we should overestimate how important that is to us. So we've got to get back and start managing soil. So we've got to manage plants, we've got to manage soil, we've got to manage animals, and we've got to recarbonise, which means we've essentially got to manage biology and the basic approach that that we take is the old Hippocratic oath is first do no harm. And by do no harm, I mean do no harm to soil biology or to soils. And if we can just take that simple little mantra forward, I think we can reverse it and stop the, the desertification of our landscape. And that's what it is. It's desertification. I think living in the on the continent of Australia with a much more brittle environment, you are perhaps more used to thinking about weather and impacts on a, on a landscape scale than we are here in North America. So I'd I'd love to hear your perspective. You used the words a moment ago of the, the small water cycle. So what is the small water cycle? What is the, what is, if there's a small one, I'm assuming there's a big one. How do the two compare and how can our behavior in agriculture influence them? All right. So the big one is mainly the one that operates over the oceans and the small water cycle is recycling water within our landscape. There's a number of things that we've done there to change that. So losing the carbon means that we've actually lost the storage, the water storage and water holding capacity within our soils. That carbon's in the atmosphere and that moisture's in the atmosphere, both the carbon and the moisture uh, and I personally believe that the moisture is probably contributing more to climate change than the, the CO2 is. But we can return that moisture to the landscape, which allows it to recycle on the landscape. The second thing that we've done that has changed the small water cycle is we're maintaining large areas of bare country. In Australia, we do what's called bare fallowing. So we use glyphosate to spray out anything that grows when it rains uh, so we can store moisture to grow a crop. It's um, something that's very, very inefficient. We we get to store somewhere about 20 to 25% of the moisture that falls, but in the process, we're actually stopping it from falling. So we know from large scale where landscapes have been cleared on a large scale that when you've got bare soil, the reflectance of energy from that soil changes and will actually drive clouds away from raining in that area. Uh, And a classic example of that, and I don't know whether this happens uh, in the United States or not, but it certainly happens in Australia. When we have our early storms at the break of a season, those storms will follow a pathway. But all subsequent storms tend to follow that same pathway then. The reason is that the first pathway, they'll generally follow where the landscape is cooler. And then because that's had rain, that landscape is cooler again and all, and subsequent storms will tend to follow the same pathway. So bare land just affects radiant heat and therefore the weather clouds will hang around. And the third influence of bare ground is not having 
the Pseudomonas syringii there to seed clouds. So you've, you, on our plants, we've got the biology, the Pseudomonas and syringii floats up into the air and seeds clouds before any other particle. In other words, they can colonise water vapour into particles at a higher temperature than dust or pollution particles and then create rain and then down comes the rain, brings them back down again, they get on our plants again and then back they go to the atmosphere and you then have this cycle. So I, I believe that a landscape that is not hydrated is a landscape that remains, sort of drives rain away uh, and lowers rainfall in that landscape and that's the small water cycle. So the small water cycle is transpiration and evaporation but obviously we want it to be driven by transpiration rather than evaporation and that keeps it moving rather than evaporation and it's that cycling back into our crops and our plants that is what we need to maintain. Earlier you mentioned that we have limited the capacity of the small water cycle because we have decarbonized our soil. We often think of the carbon content in our soil and its capacity to influence soil structures that we have better water infiltration and better percolation, which are two different things that I think uh, are sometimes forgotten. So it's common to think of carbon in terms of water storage capacity, but how does carbon, increased carbon levels in our soil actually influence the water cycle? Can you finish connecting those dots for me? Because when you've got more water stored in the soil, you're able to grow more plants and therefore you transpire. In other words, it's a cycle. The water, it's more able to come from rainfall because you've got plants growing and you've got the cloud seeding happening. And then you've got storage of that water when it does uh, hit the ground, which will then grow more plants, which will create the transpiration, which will then move that cycle around and keep it rolling. If we don't have transpiration, we have evaporation, and then that is water that we have have made no use of, and it's then lost to the atmosphere, and we don't have the cloud seeding to go with it, and we can also, on bigger areas, we can also be changing the the reflectance, the heat reflectance uh, at a ground level. The carbon, I think, is essential to driving that cycle. The other part of it, from my perspective, is taking that water vapour out of the atmosphere and putting it away in the soil, I believe that that can have as big an influence, if not a bigger influence, on the climate change than CO2 will have. It's certainly the the impacts of water vapour on the heating envelope or the, the greenhouse envelope of the earth are really significant. I did host Walter Yenny here on the podcast a number of months ago where he described the impacts of that for us very eloquently. Yeah. Yeah. Walter describes it very, very well. So ultimately what you're describing and what Walter also described is that it comes back to managing soil carbon and improving soil carbon. I know this is something that you are also very passionate about and have been uh, seeking to find a way to reward farmers for improving carbon sequestration and rebuilding soil. What has your pathway been like in, uh, I guess, perhaps the first question to ask is, um, what do you see as the opportunity for carbon sequestration? What are the benefits to the grower of being paid to sequester carbon, besides the obvious immediate economic benefits, of course? My personal belief is that In a lot of Western societies, uh, and I believe the US probably hasn't starved since the the 1930s, Australia probably hasn't starved, we've got got populations that have never really starved like parts of Europe has, and therefore we don't value food. Our populations generally go for the cheapest product, not the, the best product. And what that's forced farmers to do is mine our landscape to to stay in business they've had to essentially mine the ecosystem to be able to produce food at a price that people are prepared to pay for it now if people are not prepared to pay for the 
the real cost of producing food because there's a you know there's a financial cost and there's an ecological cost in producing food that ecological cost has never been counted and it's like only just starting to be thought about i think now the way to reverse that is for society generally to be buying or or funding carbon credits through their electricity bill or through their fuel bills etc or biodiversity credits so that that income then flows back to landscape managers in return for the job they're doing in regenerating it. Now, it's to regenerate landscape means you've got to make changes. You've got to be uncomfortable. You've probably got to do things that you haven't been doing before, and there's risk associated with that. And therefore, I think there needs to be reward. And also, as we add carbon to the soil, as, as you've said many times, we're going to be improving the quality of food. And that food quality may or may not be paid for. But I see particularly carbon as being the mechanism to get additional income back to farmers who are actually doing the right thing. And because it's a credit, and I think it's one that has to be measured, then only those that are doing the right thing and putting carbon away in soils will be rewarded for it. And if society generally is serious about reversing climate change and and doing something with CO2, the largest tool or place over which we have control globally is soil. And, you know, there's about just around 1,600 gigatons of carbon stored in the top metre of soils globally. We emit about 10 gigatons of carbon per annum from basically burning fossil fuels and making cement. Now, to me, it's not a big ask to take 10 gigatons a year and put it away in in a 1,600 gigaton storage. And there's advantages in that for farmers in all the production areas that you're well aware of and and they're well aware of. There's advantages to society in doing that by reducing that carbon load in the atmosphere. There's advantages in, in being able to affect the climate because those soils are the only place we can actually reduce that additional carbon load that's in the atmosphere. So if we took that up to 20 gigatons a year, put away in a 1,600 gigaton storage, then we're doing the right thing for agriculture, for food security, for water security and food quality, as well as for the atmosphere. And I I firmly believe that society should pay for that benefit. And uh, so I got involved in in this about nearly 20 years ago started thinking about it because we had clients that were obviously sequestering carbon and I thought well wouldn't it be great if we could get our clients paid for that and if I knew then what I know now I never would have started down the carbon journey it's been um, one of the most frustrating difficult journeys that uh, that I've been on at this stage without much reward but I hope we're getting closer and closer to making things happen. I would love for you to clarify a bit more on the carbon sequestration numbers and the carbon cycle that you were speaking about. You mentioned uh, sequestering 10 gigatons in 16 gigaton storage. Does that 16 gigatons storage capacity renew every year? Do we have a continually increasing storage capacity? Do we fill up that storage capacity once? What do the overall dynamics of these numbers look like that you've been talking about? And then the... Well, let's start there. Okay, so let me answer that one first because that's a very, very important question. Agronomically, we've been taught that soils will reach an equilibrium of carbon and we can't put any more away. I believe that's a false assumption, firstly, because we're measuring it as a percentage, not as volume. So the first thing, you know, and most of our soils are measured in the top six inches, First thing that happens as we start sequestering carbon is it will start going down deeper. In our process, we measure down at least a metre and a half where we can get down that far. And we're expecting to fill that space up with carbon. When your surface reaches that equilibrium percentage, carbon will go one of two ways. It will continue to push down or it will continue to grow up. So My belief is that there is absolutely no limit, no limit 
whatsoever to the amount of carbon we can put away in soils because it's carbon that builds soils. So if we reach an equilibrium in the surface or even over one and a half metres, all that will happen is we then continue to build soil. And what can be wrong with that? And that's essentially how our soils got built. The beautiful soils that you talked about earlier in the United States got built by that process and grasslands and grazing animals. So, you know, there is absolutely no limit to what we can put away. And I think we need to break that paradigm. We think about it in terms of percentages. We've got to think about it in terms of tonnes. In terms of sequestration rates, your soils there, you know, I think have got potential of two and three tonnes and more per hectare, potentially, you know, up to 10 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year. That's 10 tonnes of carbon per acre, roughly the same number. And so if you convert that then into monetary terms, I'll use 10 tonnes because it's a high number, but it's a round number as well. What you're putting into soil is carbon, organic carbon is what we're measuring. But what you get to sell is carbon dioxide. And the multiplier from carbon to carbon dioxide is 3.67. So 10 tonnes of carbon added to your soil is 36.7 tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's actually what you get to sell. So if the price of carbon was $10 a tonne for CO2, and that's a low price at the moment in uh, California, it's uh, nearly double that would give you a gross income there of $360, well, that's per hectare per annum. So a hectare is two and a half acres in a hectare, which is pretty nice little bit of income on top of what you're already doing. Now, there are discounts on that because there are, you know, there's variability in the measurement and there's some discounts that make that a safe thing to trade. But that's essentially how it works. You add carbon, you multiply it by 3.67 and you sell CO2. And it's that multiplier that makes it work. And that's the only multiplier that I'm aware of that works in favour of farmers. <laughs> and it's a significant one as well. So you're describing a fairly significant economic opportunity for farmers. What are the possibilities of this being realized sometime in the near future for growers in Australia and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with any North American work that is happening but how how distant is this in the future? Um, In Australia it's been possible since 2014 Uh, we actually got the legislation in 2011 Uh, then we got an improved methodology in 2018 so we're currently doing it and we can sell credits from soil carbon in Australia. So we've got one, our first farmer at the moment that we measured four years ago. We've just remeasured him. He's got 20,000 tonnes of CO2 to sell off a 2,000 acre property. And that was measured over three years. And two of those three years were severe drought. So that's pretty exciting for us to have the first sort of big chunk of carbon credits uh, from soils heading towards the market. And that market will significantly improve I think in terms of the the soil carbon market globally, it is one of the most exciting spaces uh, around the world at the moment. And there are methodologies being developed in the US and in Europe that will allow soil carbon to be done, uh, to be measured and sold. What you need is the market to buy it. At the moment, you've essentially got the California market uh, in the US, so unless you're able to sell into that market, you, you've then got to look for large organisations that want to offset their carbon. The downside to soil carbon is that you've got to do a baseline measurement and then you come back a few years later and remeasure it. What you get to sell is the change from your baseline to your remeasurement. So you don't actually have anything to sell for a number of years. But I think that there's a lot of interest in in getting this going in the States and and we've got some um, probably some of the best technology in the world now because we've been working on the technology to measure this more accurately for uh, about seven or eight years. We're in the final stages of R&D at the moment and we'll be rolling out some of that technology in Australia next year. And there's interest in um, taking that technology into the US as well now. So I think you will see it within a few years. I think your your market will start to grow. There are traps for young players. I think there's two ways 
that the carbon market will operate. One is a modelled method. So if you shift to no-till, for example, then it's deemed that you're going to sequester so many carbon credits. The market does not like that stuff uh, it, because it's not measured and they don't trust it. Measured carbon then has a high value and also it comes soil carbon credits come with a lot of co-benefits. So they come with those benefits of water or food quality or biodiversity. There's a whole lot of co-benefits that come with it. So I think that over time, uh, you will see the soil carbon market develop into a massive market. Once the money starts to flow back to farmers, you will see a significant uptake by farmers. The exciting thing for me is that You can only sequester carbon if you're doing regenerative practices. So I think a price on carbon is going to drive regeneration and recarbonisation of our landscapes. And I can't think of any better thing to have happening globally. You've had a significant influence on the shift to regeneration in the Australian landscape, but it's still a very small percentage, still a significant minority. How do you anticipate seeing regenerative agriculture develop in the future? Is the adoption going to speed up? What is the time frame until we get to, let's say, 100% adoption in Australia or to 80% adoption in Australia? There's two different industries to start with. There's the grazing industries and the cropping industries. In the grazing industries, the uptake of rotational grazing is significant. I would say we're probably gone from zero to 60% in 30 years. The uptake of cell grazing, the more more intensive stuff, we're probably still sitting around three or four percent, but we have shifted the paradigm and that now is becoming the norm. In the cropping industries, I think we're at the very bottom now of a curve that's likely to start to accelerate. There's a lot of interest in regenerative ag but there's a lot of a lot of questions on the transition from where we are to where we want to be and that's a an area where i would dearly like to be working with you john and your expertise and we can bring some of that into this country i think we can accelerate that but what we're doing at the moment is i tend to work now as well at a political level and have a bit of influence and we're now looking to pull together a large training project funded by the federal government putting $50 million over the next four to five years into educating around holism and regeneration and and then putting a lot of emphasis into that transitional phase. Our focus is if we can get the next 10% within, and I think we can, within a five to 10 year period. And I think with the focus we can put into it, perhaps within five years, we can get the next 10% of the cropping industry. Once we've achieved over 18 to 20% of the industry in transition and and starting to get carbon credits coming back into their businesses, I think it will start to normalise after that. And then we'll see a natural progression, probably through to about 80% within the the following 20 years. That's the sort of trajectory that I would see at the moment. That's really encouraging and exciting to hear about the significant levels of change that have already occurred. Terry, I want to say thank you, a very big thank you for all the work that you have done over the decades. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, uh, with me and with our audience here. And I look forward to having more conversations with you in the future. Well, thank you, John. And I hope that uh, my accent wasn't too hard for people in your part of the world to understand. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you.
Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.